Hey guys, welcome back to another coding challenge video. Today we're going to be doing the left rotation problem from HackRank, and we're going to be doing it in C Sharp. So, I have the problem statement up right here. This one's pretty short and straightforward. We're going to be given an array of integers, and we're going to be shifting them, or I should say rotating them, to the left a certain number of times. Um, typically, the difference between a shift and a rotation which is why I had to correct myself, it's usually a shift. When the numbers go out of bounds, they're replaced with, say, a zero or some predetermined filler value. When you rotate an array, when something goes out of bounds, it's actually thrown back into the end. So we can see here with their example, we're given the array of one, two, three, four, and five, and we're asked to rotate it two places. So if we look at this one and we shift it two values it goes out of bounds so we throw it back into one to the the last spot which is one rotation and then two rotations would put it here so we can see right here in the final array that one is right where we would expect it to be um let's take a look at another one just so we're really sure what's going on three rotated two places is one two so we expect that to be in the front and it is so the inputs will be given apart from the array are n, which is the number of elements, and d, which stands for the number of left rotations we will be performing on the array. So taking a look at the constraints, we see that n is guaranteed to be at least 1 and up to 10 to the 5th. d is greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to n which is interesting, we'll talk about that in a second. And then we have the things in the array are going to be between one and 10 to the sixth. So nothing too crazy going on here. I think our standard data types will do just fine. So let's look at their sample input output real quick. We see we're given first n, which in this case is five, which stands for the number of elements in the array. And then four, which is the number of rotations where we're going to be performing on it. And then our space separated values, which will be in our array. And then we are to print to the console the new array. Okay, so let's talk about the approach that we'll be doing on this one. Um, I'm sure what you could do is create a new list and then try and figure out where the new index value was for the old values in A, that gets kind of complicated. So I know it's a little trick that we can do on this to make it a lot easier. But first, let's talk about why D being equal to N is kind of stupid. So when D is equal to N, we're going to be rotating the array N times, or D times. And if we do that with N number of elements in the array, we'll wind up with the same number uh, or sorry, we'll, si we'll wind up with the same array that we started with, like as if we had done no rotations on it, as if we had done zero rotations on it. So one thing to note here is that if D was allowed to be greater than N, the only thing we would have to do is take, is set D equal to D mod N. So if we look at the top, example again i'll show you what i mean so if we were to rotate this seven times this array right here then keeping an eye on the five we go one two three four five six seven so five winds up in the middle you can see that's the same as if we had rotated it two times why is that well because at every interval of n we wind back where we started so we might as well not even do that um, we might as well set D equal to D mod N and just do that. So if you run into this problem and D is allowed to be greater than N, just set D equal to D mod N and then the algorithm that I'm showing you will still work just fine. Okay, so now let's talk about the algorithm and a little bit of a trick, I guess, to solving this one. So let's switch over to the sketch pads. I find it easier sometimes to draw algorithms 
rather than just talking about them. That was a really not straight one. So let's say we stick with the same um, array that they gave us in the example. So here's the elements, and I'm going to write above here the index values of each element. So we have at the zeroth index, or another way to write this would be a trying to do a square bracket here, square bracket zero. So that's kind of at the a at the zeroth index is going to be one, and then a at the first index is going to be two, so on and so forth. Okay, so if we stick with the same example and say that d or the number of rotations is going to be two then what we're going to be doing is starting at the index d and going till the end and then we'll start at zero and go up two but not including d so we have to rephrase that in case that went over your head we're going to start at d in this case it's going to be two so index two and we'll add that one or we'll output that one the the console and then we'll go till the end of the array so we'll move on to four output that to console we'll move on to five output that to console then once we're done with that we will loop we will start from index zero and go and output each element until we reach d where we started and we won't re-output d because we already did that so i guess we could say that we'll have one for loop which will go from D inclusive to N exclusive. Because remember, N is equal to five. So we can't take A at five. The max that we can do is A at four. And then we'll have another for loop, which will go from zero inclusive up to D exclusive. Okay, so let's uh, shift this two places. So if we shift this two places, one, two, we'll get three first, and then four, and then five, and then one, and then two. So that's if we were, you know, just doing it in our heads. That's that's how we would do it, right? So let's let's work through our algorithm on paper and make sure that it's working. So if we take D at two, so d at index 2 is 3, and then we'll go till n, so we'll take, we'll increment d essentially, go at uh, a at 3, which will be 4, and then a at 4, which will be 5, and then there's nothing else left, so we'll switch down to this next range, and we'll go from 0, so a at 0 is 1, and then a at 1 is 2. We can see we wind up with the same thing. So now your next question is probably, well, what if d equals four or d equals zero? Well, that'll still work. So say say d is equal to four, right? So we'll hit the first range, d inclusive. So we'll we'll output d at four, which is five, and then we'll go till n. Well, there's nothing else left, so that that loop's done, and then we'll go from zero up to d. So what if d is equal to zero? Well, d can't really be equal to zero because of our constraints. But if it was, then we can see here that d being zero, so we'll start at d, which is zero, we'll go till n. So we'll start at zero, we'll go till up to n. So we'll output the whole list, and then we'll go to the next one, and we'll start at zero and go till d. Well, zero is D. So the way that the for loop is actually going to be set up is that it's going to skip the condition and not do anything for this loop. So without further ado, let's get into the code. So this is one of the first ones where they don't actually give you a starter method to fill out. Let's go ahead and consolidate, clean up some of this code. Okay, so Let's go to our first for loop. So we're going to be starting at D, and we'll be going up to 
a dot length. And it's as simple as just outputting that element to the console, right? We'll use the string interpolation operator and give it um, whatever element we're looking at, followed by um, a space because they want they want our uh, output to be space separated. Okay, that's it for that one. And then we'll make our second range, um, which starts at zero and goes till D. And we will pretty much just do the same thing. Console, right, A, I, space. Okay, and then if you really want to be, uh, if you don't want to trust the constraints, then we can pretty much just say D is equal to D mod. And that kind of guarantees that nothing's going to go out of, out of bounds. Let's go ahead and run this. And it looks like we're passing our test cases, or our initial test case. Let's test them against all of them. Okay, looks good to me. If you have a better way of solving this or any questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks for watching.